May I thank you for taking the time to seek out this message. It's posted in the light of the fact that we today acknowledge the power of the Lord Jesus in rising from the tomb and his once and for all conquering of death on behalf of his people. We bless God, therefore, that we serve a living and a risen and an exalted Saviour. And so I trust and pray that your heart will be encouraged today, for Christ is in heaven. The Father having said to him, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so may your thoughts be turned toward the Saviour for a little time on this occasion. Just before we read the scriptures of truth, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Eternal God and our loving Heavenly Father, we come into thy holy presence in the precious and holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for him who is the resurrection and the life, who is exalted far above all, and who sits at the Father's right hand, a Prince and a Saviour and Lord forevermore. And we rejoice, O God, in the purpose of his coming to this earth. We thank thee that he died for sinners, to reconcile his people to God, and to pay the redemption sum. And we rejoice, O God, that he has fully satisfied the just demands of the law of God. And we bless thee then today for all those redeemed by the Saviour's blood. For those listening in, who can read their titles to the mansions in glory and who have the joy in their hearts of peace with God. Father, we pray for our congregation today. We ask that thou wilt remember each one, particularly bless the elderly and the sick and the troubled, we commit them to God and to thy grace and loving mercy. And we ask that the hand of the Lord will be upon our people and upon our church. Remember the free church. We commit our moderator to thee and our ministers and those who this day will preach the word of God. May they do so with great power and grace. We pray that thou wilt remember the wider witness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus those places who are faithful to Christ and to his glorious kingdom and his blessed work and eternal gospel. And we pray, O oh God, that across this land of ours this day, there will be a gracious sense of the presence of God. And further afield likewise, where faithful men stand and preach Christ and him crucified, May they do so in the power and demonstration of God, the Holy Ghost. Remember this land of ours and our nation and those who rule over us. We pray for those in government. We pray for our prime minister that he'll be raised up to full health and strength again. And grant, O oh God, that thou wilt remember her majesty, the queen, and all who have rule and authority over us. May they rule wisely. And may they rule well to the glory of God and for the honour of the Saviour and in accordance with the word of God. We pray for our health workers and our essential services at this time of great need in our land. And, O oh God, we ask that thou wilt remember the, the sick and those who have been struck down with this virus. We pray that the healing hand of the Lord will be upon them. O oh God, have mercy upon our land. Be entreated for our land. And, O oh God, our Father, we pray that thou wilt remember and that the Lord in his grace and mercy will turn many a heart to himself in these times. And so bless our land and our nation. We pray that thou wilt protect the unborn. We ask, O oh God, that the laws that are enacted and are brought into being will be to the glory of the Lord's name. And, O oh God, our Father, we desire of thee that thou wilt watch over us and help us day by day. And so we commit this message 
and their time around the word of God to thee. And we pray thy blessing upon us in Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen. <clears throat> Our scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark chapter 14. Reading from verse 43 down to verse 50. And these words record what took place just after the Lord Jesus had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane on the evening of his betrayal. Mark chapter 14, verse 43. <clears throat> and immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there's a text of scripture that I would like to leave before you that's related to those words that I have read to you. This text of scripture is found in Zechariah chapter 13 and the verse 7. And there in the prophecy of Zechariah, at the end of the Old Testament, we read these words. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Amen. May the Lord bless his word in its reading to our hearts. There's no doubt that the words of this text in Zechariah chapter 13 and the verse 7 refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because these words were quoted by the Saviour himself just after the institution of the Lord's Supper. As the Lord and his disciples made their way towards the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26 and the verse 31 records, Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. And in that word that the Lord spoke in Matthew 26, the Lord Jesus highlighted and he foretold the solitude of, of his sufferings and death. He did so by quoting the words of Zechariah 13 and the verse 7. And it's those words from the Old Testament that I would like to highlight to you at this time. There are four things that spring forth from this verse that I would like to bring briefly before you. Firstly, you will see in this text the sword. Because this text is addressed not to a person, nor to a group of persons. Rather, it is addressed to an object, a sword. The strokes and thrust of a sword, of course, bring death. Because a sword isn't a toy or a plaything. Though some might have a sword to look at and admire in their home, yet a sword in its original use is not an ornament. No, a sword is a weapon of war. It's an instrument of death. And in this text in Zechariah 13 verse 7, 
This sword is called to do two things. If you read the verse carefully, you will see that firstly, it is called to awake. When you hear the word awake, you immediately think of sleeping. Someone awakes who has been asleep. A computer goes to sleep if it's not in use. And then when the mouse is touched, it awakes again. And when you consider the use of this word awake in regard to the sword, you've got them to think of it having been asleep, as it were, or in its sheath, or waiting to be called into action. The virgins in the parable in Matthew chapter 25 slumbered and slept while the bridegroom tarried. They were waiting, just like the sword. And then the sword in our text was called not only to awake, it was called to smite. Ah, that's what a sword does in the hand of a mighty man. In the hand of a soldier, it smites because the sword is a weapon of death. And therefore this text in Zechariah 13 confronts us with death, the taking or the laying down of a life at a certain and predetermined time. And so the picture portrayed is of this sword that's being addressed in this text, firstly sleeping in its sheath, until a time when it is called forth and it's stirred into action, it's roused against the shepherd. That's the second thing that springs forth from this text. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd. The sword is to awake against someone. You'll see it's the shepherd, firstly, who is smitten. The one who cares for the sheep. The Lord Jesus, who described himself in John 10 and the verse 11 as the good shepherd, the one that giveth his life for the sheep. And so we discover that the smiting of this shepherd was in behalf of the sheep. It should have been the sheep who were smitten. And isn't that why the Saviour died? The Lord should have said, Awake, O sword, against the men and women that are my enemies. Shed the blood of those who have sinned against me. But he didn't. Rather, he said, Smite the shepherd. Smite the shepherd. If you're a believer today, take a moment or two to Think upon that just now, that Christ went all the way to the cross for you. <clears throat> what have you done for him? Are you living your life for his glory and for his honour? Do you bear witness and testimony to him by your life and by your lip? Blessed be God, the dreadful sword wasn't drawn and brandished against you and what of you who are unconverted you've come to another easter sunday when you think particularly of the new life that christ gives to the converted soul and yet you know nothing of that life you're not a partaker of eternal life you're still in your sins and as far as your eternal well-being is concerned, the shepherd might as well not have died because you've not gained any personal spiritual benefit from that death. You're still unconverted. Oh, I would counsel you today to take him, Christ, as your saviour and to realise that he died in the sinner's place and he bore the wrath of God for sin. This sword was awakened against the shepherd. And the shepherd was smitten. But if you glance again at this text, you'll see it was not only the shepherd, but also the son who was smitten. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Of course, the verse is speaking of the one individual not only a shepherd, but the one who was the fellow of the Lord of hosts. Literally, 
The phrase is, the man of my fellowship. And the words of Proverbs chapter 8 and the verse 30 came to my mind when I thought of this. And those words say, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Proverbs chapter 8 verses 22 to 31 present Christ under the guise of wisdom. And they speak particularly about the eternity of the Saviour. And of the fact that Christ, like God the Father and God the Holy Ghost, had no beginning and no commencement. And verse 30 in Proverbs chapter 8 speaks of a state of matchless happiness, of intimacy, of dearness, of oneness, a state of pure, unmixed and ravaging delight between the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost also. Because you see, Christ was with the Father before time began. His only begotten and beloved Son. And they, Father and Son, covenanted together in the annals of eternity that the Son would die for his people in the fullness of time. That's why Christ is described in Revelation 13 and the verse 8 as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And from all of eternity past, the sword of the wrath of God rested in the sheath of the Lord's eternal decree until in the fullness of time and at the moment of the Lord's choosing, the Son came to this earth and in the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and the verse 23, Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God and by wicked hands was crucified and slain. And there on the cross, the sword of God's justice was called to awake and be unsheathed and the wrath of God was poured out upon his own dear son. The hymn writer summed it up well in hymn 100 in our own hymn book. Jehovah bade the sword awake, O Christ, it woke against thee, thy blood the flaming blade must slake. What manner of love is this? God's such love, the love that Christ had for your soul, not break your heart in adoration for him, it ought to. As we consider what Christ has done for us, the Son of God, the Shepherd, who bore the sword in his own body and was slain in the mind of God and in the will of God and at the time of God's choosing, such love for you and me ought to break our hearts. But perhaps for some, such love doesn't break our heart as it ought to do. Because we notice again here from this verse that there's a scattering. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. By the sheep that is mentioned here in the original setting, it's that little flock of disciples which followed the Saviour till he was apprehended by his enemies. And when Judas, the betrayer, and the others came, of course, then that little flock was scattered. They all forsook him and fled. That's what Mark 14, verse 50 tells us. And thus, in the hour of his need, the Saviour was left alone among those who hated him. There was none to take a stand for him or stand by his side or identify with him. In the hour of danger. It was they who had left all to follow him who fled. That's what Peter stated in Mark 10 and the verse 28. Lo, we have left all and followed them. And they had. For the best part of three years they sat at his feet. They enjoyed his words. They witnessed his miracles. They had left their family and their friends behind to be with him. But now in the 
or of his extremity they take to their heels and run. They fled, even though a few hours before they said that they would live and die with him. Peter again had been their spokesman. And Matthew 26 and the verse 35 records what Peter said, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And the Bible records likewise also said all the disciples. Oh, how quickly the heart can change. And those who a few short hours before sat around the table at the first communion service and signified their love to Christ and their fellowship with him and identified with his death and the eating of the bread and drinking of the cup now flee for their lives. And the very first test of their devotion to him. Oh, the ungratefulness of the human heart. It's deceit. It's lack of courage. It's quickness to run. Whenever you and I are called to stand for the Saviour or say something on his behalf. It was against, thirdly, the warning and the example of the betraying Judas that they fled. Because these men who fled from the place of betrayal, these men had all been present when the Lord had called Judas in John 17 verse 12, the son of perdition. And those disciples listened also as the Saviour made the chilling comment recorded in Matthew 14 verse 21. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good, wherefore that man if he had never been born. And yet they prove, those very same disciples prove in the hour of his betrayal that their devotion to Christ really was little better than Judas's was. Oh, they didn't sell him for a few coins, but they might have done had the opportunity arisen. Remember how the Lord Jesus had said, one of you shall betray me. And each man in turn said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And perhaps you as a child of God have heard maybe of someone who has betrayed Christ in some way and you've thought to yourself, what a terrible man or woman that individual must be. But you know, given the right circumstances and put under the right pressure, there's not one of us as God's people who could say of a certainty that we wouldn't buckle. Oh, the unfaithfulness of the human heart as far as love to Christ is concerned. Jeremiah says it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know, there's not one of us as devoted to the Lord as we like to think we are. These disciples fled also in spite of the Lord, having previously asked the question, whenever others turned their backs on him, in John 6, 67, will ye also go away? And yet the strange thing is that the sheep must be scattered because the shepherd must be left alone. And the Son of God must tread the wine press alone. He must not have the least relief or comfort from any creature during his trial, false trial, false condemnation and putting to death. He must be deserted. He must go to the cross alone. And on the cross, he is forsaking of his father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Divine desertion. The father leaving the son, turning his back upon the him, his darling, his fellow, his beloved, for the only time in his eternity. The Lord Jesus on the cross, he complains not of the physical torture that he felt in his body, 
nor does he complain of the scoffs and the reproaches that he had to bear, nor does he complain of the desertion by his disciples. It's the hiding of the Father's face, the turning away of his beloved. That's what caused him concern. That's what he spoke of, forsaken by the Father. And yet it must be done if the sinner is not to be deserted in eternity. Christ must suffer and bleed and die alone. And the sword of God's justice is used against him. And he bears God's wrath. And he does so alone. And thank God also these disciples who were scattered discovered also that there was a strengthening from the Saviour. And that's brought forth again in this text in Zechariah because the shepherd says, I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. The picture is of the return and the restoration and the strengthening of those who had deserted him. They are called little ones to highlight their weakness and their insufficiency. And the shepherd speaks of turning his hand upon them to show his care, his nearness, his concern for them. Because though they forsook Christ, yet never once did he forsake them. As far as his disciples were concerned, the angel said to the woman, in Matthew 28 and the verse 7, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. There was a word there on the morning of the resurrection for the disciples. Those who scattered, those who forsook him and fled. And maybe you feel the Lord in this past week. Perhaps you have deserted him in some manner, not been at your best for him. Well, here's a word for you. Because he loves you still. Oh, boy, bow before him afresh. Confess your wandering, your desertion, your coldness of heart. And he'll turn his hand upon you. And he'll give you fresh strength. To live above this old world and sin. That's what he did for these disciples. And do you know what? You never read in the Bible again that one of these men ever denied him again. He strengthened them. He bolstered their courage. He increased their resolve. Whenever they saw what love for them caused him to do, to go all the way to the cross, their love for him increased also. And their love for him was strengthened, and their resolve for him strengthened. When they saw him dying alone and suffering the wrath and hatred of man and the justice of God on their behalf, their hearts were melted. Their love increased. Because love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. May the love of Christ for you and I as seen in the cross this Easter Sunday morning. May that love constrain us to love him, to serve him. For Christ, the Lord, the Saviour and the Redeemer's sake. Let's bow together in prayer. O God, our Father, we thank you that the Lord has loved us with an everlasting love. Before the foundation of the world, he knew me and he loved me. And Christ, in the fullness of time, gave himself for me. Lord, may the love of the Saviour constrain us to love him more, 
to serve him with all of our hearts. May we never be accused of deserting him or turning away from him, but may we serve him with every fiber of our being and stand by his side day by day and moment by moment for Christ the Lord's sake. Lord bless all who have listened to this message. May it be a help to them and an encouragement to our hearts in these times. In Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Thank you for your company. May the Lord's presence fill your heart and your mind this Easter weekend. And may you know much of his peace and his grace. In the Lord's holy name. Amen.